Hello and welcome to another episode of the Business of Business podcast. I'm your host, Roy. Of course, we are the podcast that brings you a wide variety of guests that can speak to a diverse set of topics. Hopefully, we can point out something that you haven't thought about that can help you in your business, or we can provide you with solutions with things that are keeping you up at night. We have... Um, uh, we're lucky today to have Allison Lombardis with us. She is a seven-figure entrepreneur and the founder of Get Your Pretty On website and the creator of Outfit Formulas, the number one online capsule wardrobe building program in the world. She served over 40,000 women through the Outfit Formulas program and has attached, attracted an audience of millions on the GYPO website. As a former engineer, she knew there had to be an easier way to get dressed every day, so she created Outfit Formulas, a foolproof system to build your wardrobe and create outfits. An author and life coach, Allison is a thought leader in the personal style and confidence arenas. She has been featured in Forbes, Business Insider, Red Book, Life and Style Magazine, and on Good Morning Texas. Her book, The Ultimate Book of Outfit Formulas, will be released on September 14th. Allison lives in Flower Mound, Texas with her husband, Craig, and three children, Devin, Aubrey, and Ava, plus a whole host of critters from their mini farm. Allison, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, Roy. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for taking time out of your day. Uh, not only do I probably need to be a client, but uh, there's a lot of us out there that could sure use help in the wardrobe. <laughs> After taking a whole year off, it's like we forget where the uh, nice shirts and slacks are. So. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> yeah. Well, so tell us a little bit first, kind of how, how your journey went from uh, telephone engineer over into fashion. Has that some fashion's yeah, so, always been something that you've been interested in? Actually, it's not. So it's interesting. You know, I've always had creative pursuits on the side. I was in a very technical career as, as a telecom engineer for 14 years. And I just felt like there was something missing. Um, while I enjoyed the challenges of being in a technical career, I also had these creative things that were on the side that I was doing along the way. So, you know, I did some acting in the Dallas area for about 10 years, oh, wow. overlapping with my career in telecom. Um, I got my life coaching certification, started working with clients, you know, on their businesses and in, in personal life coaching as well. Oh. And I always felt like I had something else going on. So whenever, um, and, and around 2011, I got the opportunity to work from home, which was amazing. Um, something I always wanted to do as a mom of three, my kids were still pretty young at the time. And I was just, you know, just so incredibly grateful for this opportunity to do that. Um, but what I started to notice was that I didn't know how to dress anymore. It's yeah. super easy to get dressed for the office. You know, we get into our little, I want to say ruts, but they're more like routines of our yeah. office uniforms that we put on every single day. Whether that, you know, for me, it was a skirt, a blouse and some high heels or, you know, some dress pants or a button down, whatever. We know what to wear to work, right? Yeah. I didn't know what to wear to work from home. And I think a lot of us have dealt with this, you know, just during the pandemic, especially where we're just not quite sure how to dress for the day. So I did the thing that I probably shouldn't have done, which was default into throwing on my faded yoga pants every morning, throwing on a sweatshirt, a big t-shirt, pulling my hair back in a ponytail and calling it a day, um, which was fine because I got ready really fast. Right. Yeah. But I noticed over time that things were changing and I couldn't quite put my finger on it. I felt like, I didn't have as much motivation as I did when I first started working from home. And um, I didn't want to work out anymore. I, I wasn't making time for that anymore. And I wasn't taking care of myself. I wasn't cooking as healthy as I used to. And it was like this whole snowball effect of these things happening. And I kind of just woke up one day and said, what happened? Like, what changed? And how can I get out of this? And so the first thing I knew that I could do that was super easy was get dressed in real clothes, take a shower, you know, put on some makeup and feel good about how I looked for the day. And even if no one was going to see me, you know, if I was seeing my kids off to school in the morning or whatever, and then getting ready for the day. So I did that. And the first day that I did it, I was like, wow, I feel so much better. I feel so much more productive. And um, I just feel better about myself. And I just kind of went through the day feeling like every like I was clicking on all cylinders. Yeah. And um, when my daughter got in the car that afternoon, she looked at me and she kind of did this double take. And I said, what, honey? She said, what happened to you? <laughs> and I said, what? And she said, you look pretty today. 
And I think for me, that was really that <sighs> moment like where I thought, okay, this isn't just affecting me, it's affecting everyone around me too. Yeah. And I want to be the best version of myself. And in order to do that, then I need to take a little bit of time and devote it to getting dressed every day and yeah. to taking the steps that are going to make me feel good. But the problem was that all of those clothes in my closet would have worked great in an office. They just did not work for my work from home lifestyle. So that's really why I started blogging. Um, I had to reinvent my wardrobe to work for my new lifestyle. Yeah. And as I went through this journey, I started blogging about it and other women started following along. They're like, hey, I'm a work from home mom. I'm a stay at home mom. I don't go into an office anymore and I don't know how to dress. And really that's what I was teaching them. I was just one step ahead in that journey, but enough to be able to say, this is what I'm learning. This is how I'm rebuilding my closet. And that is how everything started and just kind of really took off from there. Wow. Yeah. It's, and it's different. I have to admit for men and women, you know, we do the smell test. If it, you know, if it doesn't smell bad, then it's good, good to go. But, but, you know, especially working from home, it, it's a challenge because, you know, I, I, as I told you pre-show, I really wasn't kidding. I have a, a nail over here on the wall that I keep my uh, nice shirt on. And then it's usually uh, sweats or uh, t-shirt and shorts is, you know, what I do. And that, uh, that worked really good back in the olden days, but now that Zoom has become more prevalent, it's like, well, you know, you have to appear on camera three or four times mm -hmm. a day, so you have to probably do a little bit more. But I think for women that it's even a, a bigger challenge because just there's so many components. Like, you know, we have slacks and shirt, and that's really about it. But I know it's more it's more complicated. I've seen it in action. So I don't know. It is, yes. <laughs> Slightly. But, but, but then there's also the fact of, like you said, uh, dressing for the office is one thing, but if you're home and you've got kids and you're chasing them around, sometimes that's not always the best thing to just go with. And so never really thought about it, but it's an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. And so, um, what, so how does this work as far as the uh, outfit formulas? Do you just, uh, I, I wouldn't even know where to start. So I'll let you tell me okay. kind of a little bit. How, sure. So, yeah, so if I so. called you up and said, hey, uh, or emailed you and said, hey, I really need some help, where would you start? Besides probably firing me for a customer before you get started, but pr <laughs> pretend, I, pretend I did have some potential. <laughs> no, we never fire anybody. No, I'm, I really love meeting people where they're at as far as, as far as getting dressed and building a wardrobe. And I started out with formulas in 2014 after I had been blogging for about two years. So I really had built an audience up at that point and was able to go to them and say, what would you like to see more of? What can I do for you? What kind of service can I provide for you that's gonna help you get dressed every day? Or it's gonna make this easier for you. And I sent out a customer survey at that point and, or a reader survey, because they weren't customers yet, but I asked them these questions. And when I started going through all the responses that came back to me, there were so many women saying, hey, just give me a list. Tell me what to go out and buy. I want to know what basics to have in my closet. And I want to know what seasonal trends to add in to keep things fresh and new. And I thought, great, I can do that. Sure. So I started working on this list. And then I realized as I was going through it, well, what good is this list if I'm not showing you ways to pair it up? So I inadvertently created a capsule wardrobe, which is basically a group of pieces that can mix and match easily in your closet to create outfits. Oh, okay. And this first capsule that came out, of outfit formulas, um, I thought, you know, maybe 50 women would sign up. Well, 500 signed up out of the gate, and I realized right wow. then and there, okay, this has definitely got some potential to become a really big thing and grow yeah. into, you know, a great community of women who are able to support each other on this style journey. So I started it as a seasonal program, and what I do is I give women this shopping list of top, bottom, toppers, which were, are essentially jackets, um, shoes and accessories. So there are five pieces of an outfit formula. And then once they have the pieces, then they mix and match all of those. So there might be, you know, say five pairs of jeans or pants or skirts on the list, and then six or seven tops, and then three jackets, uh, four different types of shoes, and then some accessories. And I take those pieces and my engineering mm -hmm. mind comes in handy here. And I just mix and match them into different outfits and okay. show the women different ways that they can wear them. So the cool thing about this is that it truly works for every body. So all every shape, every size, it does not matter. It works for every budget because I am giving you guidance and telling you these are the categories of items you need. For instance, a striped top. You can buy a striped top at anywhere from Amazon to Neiman's. It doesn't matter as long as you have that striped top. Um, and some women do thrift shopping for their purchases too. And others 
find that they have a lot of the pieces in their closets. So they don't have to do any shopping at all. They're just seeing new ways to pair off the items. And that's what I love about it is I feel like I'm able to democratize personal styling. Most women aren't going to spend $150 an hour to have a stylist come in, show them how to pair up pieces in their closet, and then take them out shopping to buy more clothes. Uh, they just want somebody to give them ideas and tell them what to buy and yeah. then be able to pair it up. So I really believe that that's the way that my program kind of created disruption in the personal styling space because it wasn't a one-on-one -on -one program. It's a group program. Yeah. And also because I don't send the clothes out. Like there are companies out there like Stitch Fix and other box styling services that send you a box of clothing that may or may not work for your body shape, that maybe the quality is not quite what you want or the price is too high. Um, with this, I'm allowing you to pick those pieces and pair up the outfits and giving you the inspiration to do that. So I love when women can shop with a purpose, that we're not yeah. just walking into the store and saying, I don't know what to buy. I used to be a terrible shopper and I would do that all the time, just kind of walk in and get overwhelmed or chase the bright, shiny objects and take all the stuff home. And then I didn't know how to pair it up. Yeah. So I really wanted to make that easy for women and just take away that decision fatigue of deciding what to wear every morning. Now they get an email in their inbox or they log into our membership site app on their phone and they see exactly what they're going to wear every single day. And it just makes it one less thing that they have to worry about. Yeah, and that's cool because I know for myself, I, I'll find myself in a rut is like that pair of pants and that shirt, you know, and I don't really look outside that box to see that you, mm -hmm. know, you can mix and match. And I, I think uh, I come from a time that uh, nowadays it's a little more liberal in what you can mix and match. It's not as, uh, I don't know, used to seem like it was a very stringent code about, you know, yes. how you, how you did <laughs> that. Relaxed, yeah. Relaxed. yeah. <laughs> so, um, Let's talk a little bit about this transition. So uh, I know that you were saying you were kind of winding down, you know, at the uh, telecom. But ha had this been a thought that something you had been doing prior to that, that you were kind of starting to build the list up? And then at that point, it was like, OK, now I get it. And this is the direction I'm headed. Yeah, so I had been blogging for about six months when my manager came to me and said, hey, um, we can move you into a data group. I, I was a member of an engineering group that had 20, 20 engineers in it, and I was a team lead at the time. And by the time I left in 2013, there were two engineers left in that team. So I had the opportunity to either go and retrain and do something completely different or take a chance on this blog that I've been only doing for six months. And I decided to kind of take the chance on it and see what would happen. Um, so for the next year, I took that severance, I put it in the bank, and we were very conservative, you know, living off of half of what I used to make, honestly, yeah. just to make it stretch as long as possible. And I put everything into growing that blog, into growing my readers. What happened at the end of that year when that severance was gone? I wasn't making any money. Yeah. <laughs> and I think this is an important part of the story that I did not make money for two years. I blogged. I created free resources. I was yeah. blogging sometimes five and six days a week, just putting information out there and growing my readers, growing my followers, right. building my email list so that when I did launch Outfit Formulas in 2014, it was a six-figure business in year one. Wow. And, you know, this is one of the things that I tell entrepreneurs all the time is that you put in the effort and you've got, the, like the hardest part of being an entrepreneur is doing the work when you're not seeing the results because you just have to trust. Yeah. that it's going to come like six months, a year, two years later down the road, when you look back, you're going to say, well, this is happening because of the things that I was doing back then. Right. And we're so used to that instant gratification and we want those immediate results and those immediate sales, but sometimes it doesn't work that way. And not everybody has the luxury of a severance package. And I do understand that maybe you have a side hustle and you're still in, you know, in corporate America, you're, you're, you're trying to transition out. Um, just trust that, if you keep putting in the work, <laughs> someday yeah. it's going to pay off. Right. And and then you'll have that audience and those people that are there ready to buy what you're selling at yeah. that point. I think it's good, too, that, you know, you have that passion <clears throat> because that's what sustains you on those days you mm -hmm. wake up and say, I've been working hard at this and I, I see nothing at all. But if you really feel passionate about what you're doing, it makes you push on. So um, I was going to ask about, so you get your severance you leave and the first day you're at home do you like I mean have you just got your minds already made up that that first day off you were pushing it or was there some time where you kind of like eh is this really what I want to do was there any of that decision making 
You know, it was scary. I think that that first six months, honestly, were the scariest of my adult life because I didn't, I didn't know if it was going to work, and there were no guarantees that it would. And my, the, the I worked for Verizon. When I left, they assigned me a career counselor as part of my severance package. And she and I would jump on the call, you know, once a week and talk about what was going on and talk through different options. And there were times when I was scared, and I was like, oh, I'm just going to run back into telecom and she would say no I really think you need to try to make a go of this like this is your thing and every time I talk to you this is the thing I can hear you get excited about and you get passionate about and you start talking really fast and (laughs) and you start using hand motions and and this is what you need to do you don't need to go back to telecom and I would say okay okay but you know I'm scared I'm scared it's like okay all right just keep going and I think I needed that voice there to really just cut through the fear for me and yeah. help me to tap into my intuition and tell me what she was seeing in me. And that's what sustained me. And I, t- I laugh. I tell people all the time, I quit. I've quit this like a hundred times, probably a hundred. I wake up the next morning and I start it again. Like, yeah. it's fine. You can quit at 5 p.m., yeah. but you're going to start the next yeah. day. And, and you'll have days like that where you're just going to feel like, you're getting nowhere and nothing is happening or everyone's blowing past you. And social media especially makes us feel that way. Cause we yeah. log in and like comparison is the thief of joy. We see everybody on social media and you see all these other businesses that start out with you and you think, Oh gosh, they've got it so together or they're so far ahead of me or whatever, but you really don't know what's going on in the yeah. inside of that. And everybody struggles and has their things that they go to go through. And yes, I might be at seven figures now in my business, but it takes an average of 10 years to get there. And I'm on year nine. So it's not, it wasn't an overnight success by any stretch. And um, if you keep at it though, I promise you it will pay off. Yeah. Cause most of the time we see these overnight successes and it just means that we've just kind of become, uh, we've just seen them in the last overnight. They've, you know, they've all got these 10, 15, 20 year stories before they got to that point. And you said that earlier about the instant gratification. I think that to use the old agrarian uh, thing is, you know, we have to plant the seed and then we have to cultivate it before we can actually harvest it. And so many, and this, it goes into sales too. You know, when we talk about sales, people want to call you up. Are you ready to buy? No. So they're off to the next one. They don't take the time to try to cultivate it. And it's the same being this, being an entrepreneur and, uh, it's a struggle. There are times, and I, it's funny, as I had a, an interview years ago, and a, a young lady was asking me, uh, have you ever thought about quitting? I said, probably three times this morning, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Yeah, but it's like, you know, it's like at some point you get to, it's like, well, it's really not an option because I believe in this enough. Then, you know, I'm just going to keep pushing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but that's interesting. And I think also too, talking about the importance of surrounding yourself with people, not, not that tell you what you want to hear, but that can be encouraging to you, you know, like this lady, because it's, it, sometimes it can feel lonely, especially if we're, if we're doing it by ourself is that, you know, and I'm fortunate with Terry, she is awesome to bounce ideas off or to cry on her shoulder or, you know, walk outside and throw a rock or whatever. And then when I, (laughs) when I'm done with it, she'll pat me on the shoulder and say, you know what, it's going to be a better day tomorrow. We're going to just push on through. And Mm -hmm. sure enough, it helps. So, you know, I guess the message is get a coach, surround yourself with some other business people, you know, talk to, you know, have somebody that you can talk to. It makes a world of difference. It really does. Yeah. Yeah. Every, all of us need those sounding boards and we need more than one. Like I, I rely on my husband a lot for that too. I have, my business manager, who's my right hand woman. And I have all these different people in my life that I can go to and know that, um, that I'm not alone. And I think it, you know, it can be, they say it's lonely at the top. And when you are a founder, you are a CEO and you're the one that's responsible for everything. Uh, you really have to make it a priority to have that support network in place for sure. And I, I even joined my mastermind groups. I find that they're really super beneficial, not only for your network, but just the emotional support people who really get, what it's like to be in the trenches and be there with you. Yeah. So let's switch over. The other interesting um, aspect that I I found about your story is that you actually blog for two years. And, you know, I realized that some of that was still when you were uh, working for your other company. But uh, I think that's another point that we could talk about, about the instant gratification is I, I talked to many people that like, I did two blogs, 
but you know, my phone's not blowing up or people aren't walking through the door. It's so much more to that. So I want to tell us a little bit about, you know, how you went through that process. Yeah. So, and, and this is a topic I love talking about this, especially whenever I'm exploring the entrepreneurial side of, of my business and, and that story, because I do encounter so many entrepreneurs that come to me and say, hey, I'm just getting started out, or I've only been at this for about six months, or I'm just, I'm not making money. And I say, yeah, you're, you're right. You're not making money. <laughs> you probably shouldn't be right now. Like that's, right. that's true. Um, yeah. So building that audience first, I mean, there, there are two ways you can start a business and some people get frustrated because they don't have the audience there. They have the idea, they have the concept, they have the product or they have the service or they have a program that they're trying to sell but they don't have anybody to sell it to. Right. So if you're in that situation and you're wanting to get results faster, then that's when you've got to put some money behind it. And you've got to be able to pay for your traffic and pay for your marketing and your ads and all of the things that are going to bring eyes to you. And, but I did it organically. And I think that there are definite advantages to organic growth. Number one, it's relationship building. So you're going to be bringing those people on the journey with you. They're going to be engaged with you. They're going to love knowing that they were part of your story. I have people with me that have been with me since I started blogging in 2012 that are now customers that have been with me for years and years and years because of that personal relationship that I was able to cultivate with them and continue throughout all of these years. So, um, you know, you get that opportunity when you're producing content. People trust you. People like you. They get to know that you're somebody that's going to keep showing up for them. And when I was blogging every week, they were getting glimpses into who I was as a person. Um, they were seeing that I was going to be someone that was going to be around for the long haul. So that if they did make a purchase for me, they didn't have to worry that I was just going to take their money and run. Right. Um, but it's all about that, you know, the no like trust factor. They, they get to know you, they like you, they trust you, and they'll be fans for life. And it's really about kind of creating that, I want to, I use the term cult following because isn't that what everybody wants? Like there are right. companies out there like Whataburger and, you know, these other companies are doing this so well where they have this cult following of loyal fans that absolutely love them and are there for them and cheering them on. And that's, that's really one of the biggest benefits of just going slow and gaining that organic following and all of those people that are there just cheering you on. And the, Another great thing about that is you can involve them in what you're creating. Yeah. I involve my readers all along in everything that I've ever done. I say, what do you want to see? What do you like to wear? What trends do you like this, this fall? What colors are you liking? What patterns? And I can take all of that feedback and yeah. create a product that they've been involved in and that they love. Yeah. And that absolutely makes selling a really easy thing for me to do. Yeah. No, and I think that engagement because a lot of times and it's hard in the beginning but you know we're blowing this information out there but we're not really trying to engage our audience which i think that's what leads to the cult following like you're talking about is that you've engaged them you're you uh you care what they think which is important that's what people want to do they want somebody to care what they think and be as responsive as they possibly can to that mm -hmm. definitely yeah. yes yeah and i just uh Again, there's a there was a guy, and I think his name was Paluzzi, Joe Paluzzi. Uh, he's a marketing guru guy, and uh, he wrote a book about this. About he blogged for like, like you said, two years, with really not even a path, a service, or a product in mind. I think he was, you know, talking about something specific, but he actually blogged for this whole entire period, getting that feedback so he could decide, you know, kind of which direction he wanted to navigate to versus just you know, like you said earlier, too, it's like, OK, well, I dreamed up this awesome product in my basement, but I don't know if anybody else thinks it's awesome. I do, but maybe there's something mm -hmm. like it out there. Maybe it's like I wouldn't waste my time where, you know, when we do engage and we do some of this uh, upfront work, we can get a we can get an idea of, yeah, this is not so great or, uh, you know, maybe we need to tweak this or tweak that. There's just a lot of information we can get out there. Absolutely. It's, it's a gold mine when you have those people that are already there that, you know, you can use as your beta testers and, yeah. and can give you that feedback yeah. and then you can launch it into the world in a, on a bigger scale. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you've talked about this as well, but uh, education, you know, I think to me, that's what I always strive to do with my blogs is not 
I don't want to tell people how awesome I am or how awesome the company is. That's always better from a third party to let <laughs> for people to tell other people how great mm -hmm. you are. But yeah. uh, try to make sure that we're giving people actionable items like in your in your position, but also, you know, like when I send emails out to different groups, I may say, um, Hey, I found this article. Here's a couple of really good points that might work, you know, might be something for you to think about, but always continue in this education prog process. I think it, it's engaging because people are, you know, glad that somebody's there to try to help them. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. I, I, I love educating and I think that a lot of us kind of get stuck in this headspace where we think I'm not an expert. So why would anybody want to listen to me? Well, you yeah. don't have to be an expert. You just need to be one or two steps ahead of the people that you're talking to because right. they sometimes don't want that expert. You're more relatable than somebody that they see is an expert on a topic. And I've had to really view myself in that way as a stylist because I did not come from a style background. I am self-taught. I'm, yeah. you know, in, in the same thing with being an entrepreneur. I didn't come from a business background. I taught myself <laughs> how yeah. to run businesses, yeah. but that doesn't make my experience any less valuable um, in, in order to share it with others. It's yeah. just about giving them the shortcuts that you're learning along the way. That's what they want. Yeah, because I think we're all experts in our journey. You know, it's like, is that journey uh, relatable to other people? But, you know, once you've gone through a buying process for any uh, product or service, you know, you're pretty well aware of, you know, the different aspects of it, what you should look for, the pitfalls. And so I think, yeah, we are a little hard on ourselves that we think we have to have years of education or experience. But again, I think this gets back to passion. If you're willing to learn, you're willing to listen, and, and that's your passion, it really comes across to our readers or listeners very much. It's very loud, louder than the words sometimes. For sure. And authenticity is something you can't fake and people can see through that, even though you might think you can fool them on social media or in your blog posts or whatever, but they're going to see through that if it's something yeah. that you're not truly passionate about. Um, for an instance, I have a good story to tell on this. So when I started out as a blogger, the primary business model was to sell clothing to people that would come to your website or would follow you on social media. So you would earn some commission on the back end of that. So I would send them to you know, Nordstrom and say, hey, you can buy the shirt I'm wearing or whatever. And I would earn a little bit of money. So that's what was working really, really well. And it still works really, really well. There's influencers that are making millions of dollars a year on YouTube and Instagram and TikTok and all of the places doing this business model. But it was inauthentic for me because I didn't shop a lot. Yeah. I reused the pieces in my closet. So I learned early on that my readers were going to pick up on that if that wasn't an authentic to me behavior to be out shopping constantly. And they did. And then I started saying, well, how am I going to make money if I don't do this business model that everybody else is doing? But that's when they came to me with the idea. I didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. They were waiting. And because I attracted the right people to me right. that were also not into just going out and buying a lot of stuff, I was able to to create a business that was really, truly authentic to who I, am, who I am as a person. And I think that that just strengthened that relationship and that trust factor there as well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, so let's talk about the blog for a few minutes. Um, did you start out just blogging or did you use social, like Instagram is huge on the pictures that were you putting a lot of stuff up there as well? So I started off just blogging and this was in 2012. So at that point, Instagram was probably in its infancy. I had a Facebook page uh, associated with my blog, uh, but I wasn't really putting a whole lot into social media at that point. Okay. One of the things that I want to stress is that social media is great, but you own your website. You own right. your assets. You don't own your social media following. And yeah. if Facebook, Instagram, whatever goes away tomorrow, you lose all of those people. So if right. you're not building your own platform, then you're making a big mistake. So I, one of my biggest regrets is I did not start my email marketing list early enough in my blogging career. I didn't start it until I was probably around two years in, and then I started building my list. Um, but that list is something else that you own. You always have those contacts. They belong to you, and you will always have those people to communicate with, even if something else falls by the wayside. So I wasn't doing a lot of social media back then. I do now, um, but I use social media more as a handshake and get to know me opportunity, not as a sales opportunity. We do run ads on Facebook and Instagram. 
Um, and Pinterest is my top traffic referrer to my website because I have a very visual company yeah. and it works very, very well for me. Um, and I do put some money into ads over there too. And I have specialists that kind of work in each of the social media platforms to help us get the most out of them. But at the end of the day, my program sales are my bread and butter. They're my revenue. And that's what I focus on is what assets do I own and how can I feed into my program? And, and that's really, it, it's hard because you get distracted by, oh, it's fun to have all these likes <laughs> and followers here and there. And, right. and our egos love that stuff. But when it comes right down to it, my P&L statement comes at the end of the month, every month. And I take a look at that and I realize, okay, this is what really matters is, yeah. you know, getting people into the program and social media is fine to entertain and educate and inspire people and create authority. But at the end of the day, you've got to be feeding them into whatever your yeah. program product is as well. Yeah, because two, two examples I like to give is that uh, nowhere on an income statement do you see uh, Facebook likes listed on that. And then, <laughs> so true. And, and also, I, I told, you know, this uh, little Mexican restaurant we like to go to over here, you know, she brought the check one day and I said, oh, here, I got a uh, thousand Facebook likes. I'll just put, you know, just take the take out of my likes. And, you know, she didn't understand <laughs> what I was talking about. But, you know, it, it, it's kind of funny because we sometimes we do lose our way and think about these vanity metrics versus, you know, what does it take to put money in the bank account, which is what we need to do. So, but you mentioned you didn't start your email list until later. So uh, how did you grow that in the beginning? Was it just word of mouth and other people sharing your uh, blog on your website with their friends? Yeah, so it was mostly just organic traffic. Um, For the most part, I was serving a niche that no one was at that point, which was really helping work from home moms and stay at home moms feel stylish and not in the sense that they had to be dressed up, but more about cute, casual put together looks like t-shirts and jeans and sneakers and nothing that was really very like haute couture, high fashion. And there weren't a lot of blogs out there at the time that were like that. So back in the early days of blogging, we used to do something called blog hops and we would host them with other bloggers. And essentially it was this piece of code that you would put in a blog post and people could link up their blog posts to it. Okay. Um, and I think that a lot of my growth came through these hops because people would hop to the different blogs, would comment on them and would start following them that okay. way. So it was really a cool way to create, you know, like viral um, hits on your site yeah. by collaborating with other bloggers. And I brought a lot of traffic in that way. And I also started out with a few bloggers that were in my circle that were just getting started with me and were kind of blowing past me at that point, if I'm being honest. Um, it's funny now because I've kind of like been in it in the long, like the long haul right. <laughs> for so long that everything is sort of leveled out. And I'm kind of going like this now where they're kind of like this, but um, they were doing a different business model than me. It was all about the affiliate commissions model. But that group of core bloggers that I started with, we all just kind of lifted each other up at the yeah. same time too. And we're sharing each other's content and just getting everyone's names out there at the same time. Yeah, it's uh, important to, uh, you know, kind of be run your own race, be in your own lane. You know, we need to Mm -hmm. know what the competition is doing. We need to check it out and be, don't be blind to it because we can learn a lot from their research, their mistakes and their successes. But when we look at, are we successful versus somebody else? Those pictures aren't always the reality you know we see the mm-hmm. guy with the new car and the new boat but we, we really don't even know if he owns any we don't even know if he owns any one of those so uh just if you have if if you're passionate you got your plan just you know work your plan and keep moving forward 100 yeah. percent, yes not that consistency beats anything else yeah. you know just showing up every single day and doing it over the long haul yeah which kind of brings up the next question i had on the there's always uh, a number of experts weighing in on the number of blog posts we need to make per week. How long do they all need to be? So in the beginning, when you were starting out, what was your averages and generally what were you putting out? Yeah. So it's interesting because you can talk to people today who say blogging is dead. Most of those people would be millennials or younger. And I kind of get where they're coming from. However, blogging is not dead at all. If you are wanting any kind of search engine optimization on your site, if you want to hit, if you want traffic 
you should be blogging, right. period. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you're going to pay some SEO expert to do a bunch of work for you on the back end and get traffic to your website, blogging is still an incredibly powerful tool. And I 100% am still totally on board with it. Yeah. In the beginning, I was creating probably around five to six pieces of content a week, okay. which was a lot. So yeah. I was blogging on almost a daily basis in the beginning. And I did that for, you know, consistently for almost two years. Oh, wow. The great thing about that was, not only were my people getting to know me, knowing that I was showing up consistently, um, but Google was, you know, crawling my site every single time I put that new content out there and creating all of this great stuff on the back end that I'm still benefiting from because it's day. And I talked to an SEO expert last week and I said, I'm kind of embarrassed to say this, but I've never done paid search engine optimization. And he said, well, give yourself some grace because I want to tell you that you are ranking organically on 19 unique keywords and that's amazing and he said wow. that's the result of you just blogging all these years yeah. and putting that content out there so yeah. um yeah so you don't have to do that much content if you don't want to um but if you are going to do it just be consistent with it don't do a blog post you know five times in one week and then wait a month and do <laughs> one more like commit to one blog post a week or commit to one every two weeks or whatever just make sure that you stay on a schedule because that also helps the people that are following you know hey, she's going to show up with new stuff now. Yeah. And then what I also do is I send out a newsletter once a week on Wednesday mornings. I've been doing this for ever since I started my email list. And I put all the blog posts in that newsletter so they can click through and visit anything that they may have missed. Uh, we pull evergreen content because there's so much out there. We don't have to reinvent the wheel with content. You can yeah. repurpose it. Your people don't care. They will read it again. They might yeah. get something different out of it this time than they did the first time. So don't think that you constantly have to always be creating content either. You can go back and pull up some of the stuff that you've done in the past too. Yeah. So how long were, uh, when you were putting out four or five a week, uh, how long were those typically word count? Typically, you know, no more than five to 700 words. Okay. And okay. I could get away with that because I was putting a lot of outfit photos in there. So yeah. images, Images can definitely, you know, take the place of putting in a lot of, you know, words. Right. And if you're going to be using a lot of images in your blog post, just remember that your images have tags on them also. So, you know, kind of like getting into the technical part of this yeah. because I'm an engineer, I got to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, use that to your advantage because you can rename your images with those image tags and they will also index in Google so that when people put in keywords and they do these search terms, then your images will pop up too and they can find you that way. Yeah. Yeah, definitely pictures and videos, anything we can plug in there. But because the, there's always this, it's kind of shifted. Used to it was that, you know, 800 is a pretty good target. And then now I see a lot like 2,000, 2,500 words. And it can depend on the industry that you're in. I'm just, I don't have that long of attention span. So for me, Six, seven, eight hundred words is probably uh, just long enough for me to look at, get all the information I need. So I think that's uh, it's a good point to make because sometimes people get so caught up in, oh, t you know, this crazy word count that they don't do anything. And, and that mm -hmm. analysis paralysis sometimes it's, you know, just keep if you're consistent and you put out the 700, 800 words, you can see as, you know, you're a great representative of what can happen if you just stay after it. And as far as the indexing, you're right. I think the uh, putting good content out is, is definitely the way to the top of Google. And Mm -hmm. We have to make it good. There's a lot of behind the scenes on that because, you know, Google likes to rank for the experience of their consumer. So obviously make sure that we're giving them good, uh, consistent content that, you know, that they're enjoying and that's easy to read and all those other things. I don't, any other tips along those lines that you have that you did? Yeah. So YouTube is really powerful too. So if yeah. you Google virtually any person or business, one of the first things that shows up on that first page from Google is their YouTube videos, if they have yeah. a YouTube presence. If you're creating any kind of video content whatsoever, if it's on Instagram for IGTV, if it's on Facebook, if you're doing live, download that content and upload it to YouTube yeah. because that is really going to help your ranking and Google loves to show the YouTube results. So, yeah. um, you know, we, we definitely utilize video in that way. And I feel like video is such a powerful way to connect with your audience too. 
Um, all of the platforms are rewarding it now. Uh, Instagram's loving Reels. Those are just those short little 30 to 60 second videos, yeah. 15 to 60 second videos that, that people are doing now. And um, I've been resistant to some of the newer social media platforms because I'm really not sure like what, <laughs> where should I be spending my time, right? Yeah. Um, but I did finally become a late adapter to TikTok. And um, that's another place where you don't have to pay to play yet. And if you feel like there's something that you can share on TikTok, I created a video two weeks ago. I'm very new to the platform. I had maybe like 40 followers. And over a single weekend, it got 150,000 views and I was at 5,000 followers in wow. a single weekend. So yeah. content is still very much able to go viral on yeah. TikTok. And if you don't think it's your demographic, let me tell you that it is your demographic. My 50 year old husband sits and watches TikTok all day long. Like I, my women are over 40 that do my program for the most part. And I was like, they're probably not on TikTok. Well, heck yes, they are. They are oh, on TikTok and they are watching the videos. So don't <laughs> discount that. And it can definitely yeah. lead to growing, you know, getting your name out there and growing your platform and doing it in a free way, which is something that's incredibly hard to do right now on Instagram and Facebook. Everything is is pay to play in, yeah. in a lot of those arenas. Well, yeah, and I'll, uh, just a small TikTok story. You know, we were the same way. Uh, neither one of us, because, you know, I just jokingly said, well, you're not going to see me over there dancing or, you know, putting any crazy moves on there for sure. But a guy just said, look, just go reserve your names just in case, you know, things change later on. So we did, and then, but now we have gotten hooked that, you know, in the morning when we're drinking coffee, we've got a couple people it's they're not selling anything but just a couple people we like to follow and look and see what's going on so it's interesting that you know like uh people of our age have you know are looking at tiktok on a daily basis so i think it's very yeah. interesting the it other is. thing you mentioned earlier uh i just want to touch on briefly i know we're getting long on time but um that content repurposing content when you write a lot of blogs and when you have that inventory it makes it so much easier for your social media campaigns because, you know, like us, we will break up uh, our videos into a couple smaller pieces to use. We will pull, you know, specific quotes or a couple sentences even from an episode and from our blogs to use. So uh, really, it's because it, it, I I, there are a lot of people that struggle. Like, I don't even know what to put up on social media. But I say if you're blogging and doing these other things, you've got the content. You just have to figure out how to use it. It's true. And if you have one piece of cornerstone content, you can take that and you can repurpose it across all your platforms. So say for instance, if you start, you could start with a blog post or you can start with a video. If you start with a video as the cornerstone content, you can take that video, have it completely, you know, transcribed on a service. There's a bunch of free services out there that do that, oh. that will transcribe that for you make a blog post out of that, embed your video in the blog post, then take, you know, 10 second clips out of that video, use it on your social media, create quote cards out of that. You can just take it and put it everywhere. You can show up on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, your own blog, TikTok, all of it yeah. just from this one cornerstone piece of content. And I think that that's super important for everybody to realize because you don't have the same followers on all those platforms. Yeah. So not everybody's going to be seeing that. And just taking that one piece of content really saves you so much time and energy and effort thinking that you have to do all of these things for all of these different platforms because you really don't. Right, right, exactly. Well, Allison, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your day. It's been a, a pleasure speaking with you, and I think it's such a great success story. I think uh, uh, there are so many people that can follow in your footsteps. So a couple things. Tell us, uh, I know you've got a lot going so on, but tell us about uh, the website, about the outfit formulas, and then, of course, uh, about your book. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so you can find my blog at getyourprettyon.com. And it's just really, it still exists as a free resource for women to really kind of help them on that style journey to give them affordable options um, for pieces that work for everybody, every budget, no exceptions. Um, I have my first book coming out September 14th. It is the ultimate book of the outfit formulas. It's already hitting some bestsellers list. So I'm really excited about that. And I'm launching the outfit formulas fall capsule wardrobe in September as well. So it is going to be a really fun and busy month, but wow. lots of really good stuff going on. You can learn more about that at outfitformulas.com. And the book is sold in 
on Amazon and in stores everywhere. Okay. Yeah, great. Yeah, you're going to have a, I think this is the end of August. We're uh, talking right now. So you're going to have a busy, probably six or eight weeks coming up, getting everything yes, pushed out sure. the door. Well, that's <laughs> yeah, exciting. You'll exciting. have to, you'll have to come back. Uh, well, maybe we'll let you rest up in October, November, but you'll have to come back <laughs> and uh, tell us how it's going. Cause that's, that's another important part is you know, I like to keep up with guests, especially who are, uh, you know, have something uh, launches like this going on it'd be nice to come back mm -hmm. and see you know how that went things that you've learned from it and uh, just be able to keep our listeners updated so that would be absolutely. awesome absolutely and yeah, i forgot I'd to, love to do that i forgot to ask what is a tool or a habit what is something that you use in your daily life that you feel adds a lot of value personal professional either one yeah so i would have to say my planner i know it sounds so basic but i have an hourly planner that i've kept ever since I first started blogging in 2012, because I feel like if I can keep myself accountable on an hourly basis, that I never waste time. Yeah. And one of the most important things I do in there is I put non-negotiable things in this calendar, like getting showered, getting dressed for the day, working out, the things that are important to my self-care and filling my cup up, because that's what makes me a better wife, a better mom, a better leader, a better everything. Yeah, yeah. All right, that's awesome. Well, again, y'all reach out, uh, take a look at all of Allison's content, and uh, we'll get her back on here to tell us how this next few months goes for her. So uh, that's going to do it for this episode of the Business of Business podcast. Of course, I'm your host, Roy. You can find us at www.thebusinessofbusinesspodcast.com. We're on all the major podcast platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Google, Spotify. If we're not on one you listen to, reach out. Be glad to get it added to make your listening easier. We're also on all the major social media networks probably hang out on Instagram a little bit more than others. So reach out. We'd be glad to interact with you over there. And a video of this interview will go up when the episode goes live. So until next time, take care of yourself and take care of your business. Mm -hmm.